It is good to be back together. Thank you for joining me again today in this podcast episode. And I want to take you back 40 years with me, more than 40 years, back to 1981, and share with you an experience I had as a lad, to share with you a story and the images that will help us understand the topic of today's podcast. So, without any further delays... Once again, it's story time with Dr. Peter. It's early July, 1981. I'm 12 years old. I'm really skinny, about five foot five, 110 pounds, very nearsighted without my glasses, and I'm swimming to the green raft with my swim buddy at Camp Onaway on the Wapakachana Lakes in central Wisconsin. We're taking on this challenge. Now, I'm the lowest form of life at Boys Brigade Camp 3. I'm a first-year boy. I'm a flick. And a flick is an acronym that stands for Fat Little Ignorant Camper. It's a, it's a term of affection. It's a sweet, ironic endearment bestowed on us campers by our fearless camp leaders. And I'm swimming out to this raft to test my mettle with the bigger boys, the high schoolers. Now the raft, what is that? That's a floating platform, 12 foot by 12 foot, buoyed up by sealed 55 gallon drums, anchored in 12 feet of clear water, and covered with green indoor-outdoor carpeting. And that is the place where the game King of the Raft was played by Camp 3 flicks of all ages, of all body shapes, of all sizes. Now the objective of King of the Raft was simple. It was to be the only boy left standing on the raft, with all challengers vanquished and in the water. Now to do that, you had to push, pull, toss, lure, or otherwise maneuver all the other boys off the raft. Now a sparse game of King of the Raft would have about six boys, but a real showdown might have 24 boys, ranging from the youngest at age 12 to the highly muscled 17-year-old incoming high school seniors with mustaches. Now, in King of the Raft, there were very few rules, and all of them were unwritten. The primary one was that there was no dragging another boy along the raft because that indoor-outdoor carpeting can tear the skin right off your back or chest very quickly, especially if the victim is struggling with all his might, as he should be in King of the Raft, and that was the norm. Also, no choking and no hitting or kicking or kneeing anyone in the groin. That's about it as far as the rules. Otherwise, it's a free-for-all with shoving and pushing and hanging and clinging and teams of boys working together and alliances broken by Machiavellian tricks, all for the great prize of being able to stand alone on the raft with all your companions in the water and to beat your bare chest and yell with all your might at the top of your lungs, I am the king of the raft! Now, Occasionally, our gargantuan 16 or 17-year-old would dominate the raft and be obnoxious as a king. And then two of the 20 or 30-something-year-old camp leaders would swim out to the raft and administer a form of camp justice by dethroning the obnoxious king. And that was done by heaving him in a remarkably high trajectory to a watery landing at a great distance from the 144 square feet of green carpeted real estate. Then the game changed. Then it was get the leader's time and the game moved into another phase when all the fat little ignorant campers, all the flicks, had a chance to take on the two leaders and a battle royale ensued with the campers on one side and the leaders on the other. I did this for seven summers, from 1981 to 1987, five years as a camper and two years as a leader. And I learned a lot of life lessons on the raft, both as a skinny, vanquished, frequently airborne flick and as king. Now, back in those days, too, it was all about boys becoming men. We didn't really worry about microaggressions. We didn't even know what microaggressions were. We didn't worry about self-esteem enhancement procedures. We didn't worry about if everybody's feelings were being appropriately managed at all times. No, this was a place where boys became men. 
So I hope I was able to create a word picture for you, some images of what it was like to be on the raft at Camp Bonaway in the Wapaka chain of lakes back in the 1980s. We're going to come back to the images of King of the Raft later in this episode. All right, so welcome to Interior Integration for Catholics. I'm clinical psychologist Peter Malinowski, and the reason this Interior Integration for Catholics podcast exists is to help you toward loving God, neighbor, and yourself in an ordered, healthy, holy way. It's about tolerating being loved and about loving. The podcast, and especially and especially the Resilient Catholics community, is a training ground for overcoming your natural level impediments, your psychological obstacles to accepting love from God and others, and to loving God, neighbor, and yourself in the best ways possible. It's all about your human formation. It's all about shoring up your natural foundation for the spiritual life. It's all about training and equipping you to follow the two great commandments, to love God with all your being, with every part of you, and to love your neighbor. This is episode 74. It's released on June 28th, 2021, and it's titled Internal Chaos and Blending versus Internal Peace and Integration. Psychotherapist Peter Mickelson describes how, quote, the unconscious mind of adults is buffeted by gale force winds of emotional chaos that originated as an infantile effect decades earlier. Emotional associations from our distant past now buffet our life in incredible, mysterious, spectacular, and frequently painful and self-defeating ways. Emotions percolate and circulate in our unconscious mind with some degree of chaos. We all know what it's like to be happy in one moment, sad the next, with no conscious input from us. We also know how hard it can be to regulate our desires, impulses, and emotional reactions. Both neuroscience and psychology have established that our brain struggles mightily and often unsuccessfully to limit the effects of, quote, irrationality, end quote. Often we try to apply common sense and reason to moderate unpleasant emotions or to curb self-defeating impulses, yet our emotional side, with a life of its own, can often be impervious to rational entreaties. End quote. All right, I want you to reimagine now the raft battle. But instead of generally good-hearted boys working on their developmental tasks of becoming men through struggling and wrestling with each other, I want you to imagine players now that believe that they are locked in a life-and-death struggle, a deadly battle for supremacy, for survival. Think of the raft battle now as a gladiatorial contest to the death. Maybe following the plot of the Death Race movie series. Remember Jason Stratham, Frederick Kaler, Ian McShane, five movies in that series? That, my dear listeners, is how it is inside for most of us, whether we realize it or not. The players are our parts. Those separate, independently operating personalities within us, each with its own unique, prominent needs, each with its role in our life, its emotions, its own body sensations, its guiding beliefs and assumptions, its typical thoughts, its intentions, its desires, its impulses, its attitudes, its interpersonal style, its worldview. They may seem like different modes of operating to us, but these parts make up a huge element of who we are. Now, our systems may seem quiet in the moment. Some of you may say, well, that's not how I experience myself, Dr. Peter. What are you talking about? Well, what I would say is that often one of our manager parts has a really strong hold on the raft. That one is like the gargantuan 17-year-old incoming high school senior who can dominate the raft for long periods of time. That one can keep the other parts in the water, some of them submerged, drowning, in an attempt to hold on to some pseudo-stability, to hold on the to the capacity to function adequately in day-to-day life. But you know what? The other parts, they're waiting, they're watching for an opportunity to leap on the raft, to leap into conscious awareness, and to forcibly dethrone the blended part who was the king of the raft. These other parts are looking for their opportunity to take over. They're looking for their opportunity to be heard, to be seen, to be known, to drive the bus, to govern the system. They want to be king too. And it's because they don't want to be silenced. They don't want to be suppressed. They don't want to be repressed. They don't want to be exiled. They don't want to be imprisoned. They don't want to be drowned in the water. Now, because of original sin, because of the sins of others, and because of our own personal sins, 
That's what it's like inside for almost everyone, whether we know it or not. Our defenses, our coping mechanisms are able to keep most of this outside of conscious awareness most of the time for many of us. Today, we're going to talk about a key word. We're going to talk about blending. And I make the argument that the most important psychological state is to be unblended. Let me say that again. This is absolutely crucial to understand. The most important psychological state for us is to be unblended. And what do I mean by that? What do I mean by unblended? So let's define it. It's definition time with Dr. Peter. Blending is the act in which a part takes over a person's seat of consciousness, when a part takes over the self. That's from Richard Schwartz and Martha Swayze in the book, Internal Family Systems Therapy, Second Edition. Let's get into this in greater detail, though, because a one-line definition is not going to cut it to get to the depth that we want to get to in this episode. There are a couple of really good blog posts by IFS therapist Jay Early. Blending in IFS, which he posted on March 7th, 2010, and another blog post that he posted on October 17th, 2018. And in those posts, Jay Early says, quote, In IFS, a part is blended with someone when they are the part as opposed to being in self. That could mean that they feel the part's emotions, they hold its beliefs, or their behavior in the world comes from this part, this blended part. A part is blended with you and has taken over your seat of consciousness when any of the three following conditions is true. This is from Jay Early. First, you're flooded with the part's emotions. Second, you're caught up with the beliefs of the part. You've adopted the beliefs of the part as the only beliefs. Or third, you're dominated by the perspective and worldview of the part. All right, so flooded with the part's emotions, caught up in the beliefs of the part, or dominated by the perspectives and worldviews of the part. Let's get into this in greater depth. Let's start with the first one, flooded with the emotions of the part. When you are flooded with the part's emotions, says Jay Early, to such a degree that you aren't grounded anymore. You are lost in those feelings. So for example, if the part feels resentment, you are fully caught up in the anger without having any reflective distance, end quote. Or let's get into an example. Let's say a guy is dating a woman. They've been dating for three months and she offers him a gentle rebuke, a little fraternal correction. She tells him that she's uncomfortable with certain ways that he looks at her because that seems too sexually tinged, like like she's a sexual object. And that activates her. She's had bad experiences in the past with men trying to push physical boundaries. And the guy starts feeling a part's emotion. A part comes up in that guy. A part gets agitated. And it gets to overwhelm because of the intensity of the emotion. Let's say that the guy gets overwhelmed with shame, right? There's no space anywhere else in his system to feel anything else because that part just blended. That shame-carrying, exiled part just blended and overwhelmed him with shame. So he's not really in a capacity, he doesn't really have the capacity to reach out in any kind of empathetic or compassionate way to his girlfriend because he's so self-absorbed with his shame. Another option, other guy, other situation, could get overwhelmed with anger, could be forming all kinds of rebuttals, could be desiring to break off the relationship, denying that he had any sexually driven intentions toward the woman, right? There's another way of being overwhelmed by a part that's trying to protect him and trying to protect him from being wounded with the intensity of its anger. That's the first way that we can blend or is be being flooded by a part's emotions. The second way is when Jay Early tells us, quote, you are caught up in the beliefs of that part so that you lose perspective on the situation. You see the world through the distorted perception of that part. In addition, you aren't able to recognize that this is one of many perspectives. You simply see it as the truth. If the part believes that the world is dangerous, that is the way you see the world, without any thought that you might be projecting your own beliefs onto the world. End quote. 
So the person becomes identified with the part in that the part takes over and its beliefs become the only beliefs that the person can hold on to in the moment. Its perspective on the world becomes the only perspective on the world that the person can hold on to in a given moment. So let's go back to our example of the guy suffering with shame. When his girlfriend tells him and gives him that gentle rebuke, that fraternal correction, he might be overwhelmed with a part that believes he's just a bad, lustful man. That's it. That's all he is. That's all that he is now is a bad, lustful man driven by shame. But now the belief comes in, right? I'm bad. I'm lustful. Can you see the overgeneralization? Can you see the lack of perspective? Can you see the global attribution? He has shrunk himself down to just one dimension. Bad, lustful man. That's all he is, right? Seeing himself just in the one dimension that we talked about in episode 72 when we were talking about seeing each other in five, six dimensions. The other guy, right? The one that um, is overwhelmed with anger, he says he's overwhelmed by a part that believes that the relationship needs to end. I'm not going to be condemned by you. I'm not going to be rejected by you. I'm not going to be hurt by you. I'm going to defend myself. You don't get to hurt me, right? These are the beliefs of a part that's blended in response to that gentle rebuke from the girlfriend, right? So that's the second, right? The beliefs, you get caught up in the beliefs of a part. The first one is you got caught up in the emotions of the part. The second one is that you got caught up in the beliefs or the assumptions of the part. And the third one is when you're dominated by the perspective and worldviews of the part. Again, this brings in all kinds of other things, you know, the particular perspectives, the kind of distorted perceptions that parts might have, right? Jay Early gave the example that if a woman is blended by a judgmental part, she makes contemptuous comments to people, right? Devaluing them, belittling them. And that's because she's blended with this judgmental part, with this really critical part. You know, not feeling enough self, not having access to a place that it's separate from the part. So you can't witness the part. You can't understand. You can't observe yourself acting, right? You can't observe this part. There's no distance there. That's why we, that's why we call it blending. It's the part has taken over. And when that happens, the blended part is now driving the bus. And it's got its hands on the levers of control within the person. That part takes over your internal raft. It becomes king of the raft. It's, it's kind of like in that Pixar movie, Inside Out, when anger, for example, the little anger character, the red one, takes over the control panel. That happens when we get taken over by our passions. For example, irascible passions, such as fear, such as anger. Everything is seen through the very limited perspective of the blended part. There's no room in the system to consider the perspectives, the beliefs, the emotions, the experiences of any other part. Okay, so there's a parable that I really like, the parable of the blind men and the elephant. And the earliest versions of this parable of the blind men and the elephant can be found in Buddhism, Hinduism, and Jainism, and they go back 2,500 years or more. And the parable discusses the limits of perception and the importance of having a much more complete understanding of a situation, of having that perspective, of being able to take some distance and look at things from multiple perspectives. Now, the rollicking American poet John Godfrey Sachs in 1872 published this as a poem called The Blind Men and the Elephant. Now, more than 100 years later, Natalie Merchant of 10,000 Maniacs fame actually sang the whole poem on her 2010 album, Leave Your Supper. It's not her best work. I kind of like Natalie Merchant. I think she's got great pipes, but this this particular rendition was, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so here is the poem. I'm going to read it to you. It's not very long. John Gordon Sachs, 1872, The Blind Men and the Elephant. It was six men of Indistan, to learning much inclined, who went to see the elephant, though all of them were blind, that each, by observation, might satisfy his mind. The first approached the elephant, and happening to fall against his broad and sturdy side, at once began to bawl, God bless me, but the elephant is very like a wall. The second, feeling of the trunk, cried, 
Ho! What have we here? So very round and smooth and sharp, to me tis mighty clear, this wonder of an elephant is very like a spear. The third approached the animal, and happening to take the squirming trunk within his hands, thus boldly up and spake, I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a snake. The fourth reached out his eager hand and felt about the knee. What most this wondrous beast is like is mighty plain, quoth he. Tis clear enough the elephant is very like a tree. The fifth, who chanced to touch the ear, said, He and the blindest man can tell what this resembles most. Deny the fact who can. This marvel of an elephant is very like a fan. The sixth no sooner had begun about the beast to grope than seizing on the swinging tail that fell within a scope. I see, quoth he, the elephant is very like a rope. And so these men of Indostan disputed loud and long, each in his own opinion, exceeding stiff and strong, though each was partly in the right, and all were in the wrong. So oft in theologic wars the disputants, I ween, rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean, and prayed about an elephant not one of them has seen. Now, what I want you to see here is that each blind man is experiencing something real about the elephant. But that vision that those blind men have, those vision, the vision that our parts have, because the blind men are like our parts, that vision is limited. And the generalizations that each of those blind men have made about the whole elephant are not warranted. And look at what the blind men are doing. They're devaluing each other. They're critical of each other. They're locked in conflict with each other. They're not understanding each other. Each of them is trying to be preeminent. Each of them is trying to impose his particular vision of the elephant on everyone. There's an analogy there. There's an analogy to our parts. When our parts are freelancing, when they're operating separate from the influence of our core self, they're going to misperceive things. All right, let's talk about parts a little bit more. Now, remember, there are three roles that parts can be in. They can be in an exile role, they can be in a manager role, or they can be in a firefighter role. Or they can have a combination of these roles as well. It can get a little more nuanced than just one role for each part. But generally, they fall into one of three roles. It's an easy way to understand it. The exiles, these are parts that have been exploited, rejected, or abandoned in external relationships. They've suffered relational traumas. They've suffered attachment injuries. They hold the painful experiences that have been isolated from conscious awareness to protect the person from being overwhelmed with intensity. They desperately want to be seen and known. They want to be safe and secure. They want to be comforted and soothed. They want to be cared for and loved. They want rescue. They want redemption. They want healing. And in the intensity of their needs and emotions, they threaten to take over and destabilize the person's whole being. The whole system of the person is under threat because they want to take over the raft. In their efforts to be seen and known, to be heard and understood, they can flood with the intensity of their experience. And that threatens to harm external relationships. That threatens to destabilize both internally and externally. And they can carry shame, dependency, worthlessness, fear, terror, grief, loss, loneliness, neediness, pain, a lack of meaning or purpose, a sense of being unloved and unlovable and adequate, a sense of being abandoned. They carry all of that garbage, all of that pain, all that intensity. And that's why the protector parts, the managers and the firefighters, try to keep those parts submerged under the water. They don't even want them to be seen. They don't want them to be heard. They want them silenced under the water. They don't want them creeping up to the raft and climbing aboard because of the intensity of their experience. Right? The managers 
These are the proactive protector parts. They work strategically. They use forethought. They plan. They're thinking about the future. They're trying to keep on top of things. They're trying to ride ahead of the wave. They're trying to keep in control of situations of relationships to minimize the likelihood of being hurt. They work really hard to keep you safe. They're, they're into controlling, striving, planning, caretaking, judging. They can be really pessimistic. They can be really self-critical. They can be extremely demanding, be really judgmental. And then there's the firefighters. Now, when those exiles break through and they threaten to take over the system, those firefighters leap aboard the raft like those young camp leaders, right? Remember, those camp leaders came out to eject, you know, the king of the raft who was being obnoxious. In this situation, the fighter fighters are in an emergency situation. It's like a fire raging in the house. They have no concern for propriety, no concern for niceties. There's no time for etiquette, for little details like that. Firefighters, they take that bold, drastic action to stifle, numb, or distract from the intensity of the exile's experience. The intense neediness and grief are overwhelming. Emergency actions, battle stations, we have got to take this on. That's what the firefighters are saying. And they don't have any concern for the consequences. You know, you got to understand we're in a crisis here. So they can lead to all kinds of acting out, alcohol use, binge eating, shopping, sleeping, dieting, excessive working out or exercise, suicidal action, self-harm, violence, dissociation, distractions, obsessions, compulsions, escapes into fantasy, raging. All of that is firefighter activity. Okay, so three roles for parts, exiles, managers, and firefighters that are on or around that raft, which represents conscious awareness. All right, so what are the signs that a part's blended? All right, how do we know if we're blended with a part? Well, you may remember from previous episodes when I've gone through the eight C's of self. When a person is really self-governed, naturally recollected, when they're in the space of governing the self well, they have these eight C's according to Dick Schwartz. And those are calm, curiosity, compassion, confidence, courage, clarity, connectedness, creativity, and there's a K to kindness. All right. So when we are not in self, when we're blended with a part, we're going to be experiencing what that part experiences. And so instead of calm, there might be agitation or frustration or anxiety or stress or anger. Instead of curiosity, we get indifference, disinterest. We get seeing parts and seeing other people in two dimensions or one dimension or no dimensions, going back to episode 72. No nuanced understandings, very reductionistic perspectives of ourselves and others. Instead of compassion, we get coolness, uncaring, being unfriendly, being hard, being reserved, being unsympathetic. Instead of confidence, we get being timid, pessimistic, doubtful, and insecure. Instead of courage, we're fearful, shy, faint-hearted, and irresolute. Instead of clarity, we're confused, we're muddled inside, things are obscured, it's dark inside, it's foggy, we're just seeing vague forms moving in a shadow world. Instead of connectedness, we get internal fragmentation, disjointed lack of relationship, lack of connection, feeling aloof from both our own parts and from other people. Instead of creativity, we're uninspired, we're inept, very conventional, repetitive futility, doing the same thing over and over again with no different results. Instead of kindness, we get this coolness, nastiness, this roughness, even internal violence to another part or external violence towards someone else, even brutality. So the opposite of the eight C's. If we're blended, we're going to start losing C's inside. Now, it's not... 100% absolute. There are times where our Lord felt anxious. There were times where our lady felt anxious. There were times where our Lord felt anger. That's not a sign of not being in self. That's happening in part because we're embodied beings. This is getting below that surface level to more of what we would think of as our core psychological self, not just the natural reactions that we have to other people. What what about somatic signs of being blended? Because a lot of times the body keeps the score. That's what Bessel van der Kolk told us in his groundbreaking book title on trauma. Exiles use the body to signal their need for help. They hide out in the heart or the gut or the back. Exiles often know of no other way to get the attention of the person. So they're going to bring up 
all kinds of somatic signs to get our attention. And that's one way that they can blend. Managers use the body to control because they contain, suppress, hold, and freeze. Managers tend to show up in the muscles and the fascia, in the joints, in the respiratory diaphragm, in the throat and jaw, in the shoulders, and the lower back. I have a good boy manager that leads me to clench my jaw. And why that manager leads me to clench my jaw, that happens when it's defending against my feisty part, who might want to say something inappropriate. See, my feisty part likes to swear. It likes to use all sorts of like really colorful language. It's creative in its swearing, and it can be really ruthless and cutting. And so if that part's really active, if that part's threatening, then this manager will come in, and it'll clench my jaw. And the meaning of that I figured out in working with my parts is to silence that feisty part, right? It's not interested in getting to know the feisty part when that's going on within me. It's not interested in meeting the feisty part's needs. It's not interested in getting to the root of the problem. It just wants the feisty part to shut up, not do anything that would harm any of my relationships or that would get me in trouble with God, right? Because of the use of coarse language or, or anything like that. Firefighters use the body to distract from emotional pain. They activate the central nervous system. They activate the endocrine system. They release stress hormones that are involved in hyperarousal and hypoarousal. So they're often the ones that take us out of our zone of tolerance. All right, so signs of blending. We have the opposite of the eight Cs. We have the somatic signs. The third thing is an agenda. Remember that parts are always seeking a good end. But they are prone, when they're not connected with the self, to lack respect for others' God-given freedom, their sovereignty over their choices. The ends justifies the means when parts are freelancing, when they're working on their own. And those means can often be problematic. Now, the blended part may not know that its means are problematic. It may be unaware of its impact on other parts or on other people. It just may not enter into its awareness. The blended part may, though, know that its means are problematic, but still feels like it's worth it to avoid a worse situation. Sometimes there's this attitude of, well, you can't make an omelet without breaking some eggs. Some parts are going to have to suffer so that the whole system survives, that kind of thing. So you might be saying to yourself at this point, Ah, uh, what you're describing, Dr. Peter, I'm kind of like that a lot, maybe most of the time. Is it, is it possible that I'm blended with a part or parts most of the time or even all the time? Absolutely, yes. Most people are blended most of the time. Many people are blended continually for decades. That's the norm. That's the norm. It's exceptional when somebody experiences being recollected on a natural level, being what IFS would call in self regularly. That's just not that common. And so one of the things that I've learned in, 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 in these 20 years of being a psychologist is how destabilized, how dysfunctional we are with regard to our parts most of the time. Now, also, blending is on a continuum. You can be more or less blended. It's not a dichotomy. It's, just, it's not just that you're blended or unblended. Different parts give different amounts of space in different moments to the self, and so it can be more or less unblended. That's an important point to make. And the other thing is that multiple parts can be blended at the same time. So just because one part unblends doesn't mean the self is now unblended, doesn't mean that there's recollection. Sometimes multiple parts have to unblend. That whole process of unblending can take some time because what can happen is that if one part unblends, another part may rush into that vacuum because they're not confident that the self can really govern the system or they see an opportunity to make their needs known and to take over the, to take over the raft, as it were, to become king of the raft. And so we really want that self to be in that leadership position where it effectively governs all the parts in the whole system. So we're going to get back to this key concept. We're going to discuss what it means to unblend. An unblended person is in self. And that means that that person's being self-led in terms of the IFS lingo. I would, I would prefer the, the language of being naturally recollected. In IFS lingo, it's being self-led. And what does being self-led mean according to Dick Schwartz? Well, definition time with Dr. Peter. <laughs> From his book, Internal Family Systems, second edition with Martha Sweezy, Dick Schwartz says that being self-led, quote, 
describes individuals who have access to their self and therefore have the capacity to hear, understand, and be present with their parts, acknowledging and appreciating the importance of their roles in the internal family system and with other people, end quote. Remember, the core self of the person is the one to govern and lead the system. That's the one that the parts need to trust as the internal leader. And it's an amazing thing, but this is true. It often doesn't seem so to people, but this is a fact that parts can hold on to the intensity of their experience. They can suffer their wounds without overwhelming the system. That is possible. A lot of times other parts don't believe this because anytime they've experienced that the part is when that part blends and it just overwhelms the whole system with all of its stuff, with all of its crap, right? Sometimes parts just don't know that other parts can contain their stuff. That's why there's this death battle. That's why there's this existential struggle for survival among parts, each of whom has needs, each of them has a perspective on what's going on. Each of them is in contact with some of the reality of the person, with some of what was experienced, with some of the history, but not all of it. And these systems get to be highly polarized with all this infighting for survival among the parts. Well, what is unblending like? What is it like? Well, if you're unblended, you have those eight C's. You have the calm. You have the curiosity. You have the compassion. You have the confidence. You have the courage. You have the clarity. You have the connectedness. You have the creativity. You have the kindness. And being unblended is the start. Once we're unblended, we are so much better able to love the parts. We're so much better able to work with the parts in a constructive way. Now, I want you to go back and remember that raft, that indoor, outdoor, carpeted raft with a leader on deck, governing and directing, trusted by the parts, listening to them, loving them, not calling them fat little ignorant campers, not hurling them into the void, but really being with those parts with the parts sharing in that love, sharing in that acceptance that the self has for all the parts, all the parts being welcome, accepted, no part left behind, all the parts getting their attachment needs met. Going back to episode 62, that's the one on unmet attachment needs and unmet integrity needs, those conditions for sure, secure attachment. Remember those five? Number one, a felt sense of safety and protection, a deep sense of security felt in the bones. Number two, feeling seen and known and heard and understood, that felt attunement. Number three, feeling comforted and reassured. Number four, feeling valued, delighted in, cherished by the self and by other parts in connection with the self. And fifth, feeling supported and knowing that the self has your highest good in in mind, right? The parts when the self is unblended, have a much greater possibility of having those attachment needs that Daniel Brown and David Elliott described, having these those needs known, having them understood, and ultimately having them met. Also, when you're unblended, the integrity needs of parts are so much better able to be met. Remember those integrity needs from episode 62? It's all of those attachment needs, but also these, right? That the part exists, that the part exists, and that part's existence is important, it exists in its own right, that that part's identity is valued, that there's a continuity of identity over time for that part, that that part can regulate itself, and that other parts can regulate themselves, that that part is integrated, that there can be coherent interconnections between aspects of experience that can lead to self-cohesion, that the part is active, can have agency, can contribute, in valuable ways to the self, to the system, that that part is morally good, that it's ontologically and essentially good, it has intrinsic value and worth, no matter what other parts may think or what other people may think, that that part can make sense of its experience and the world around it, and that part has a mission and purpose. All those integrity needs that I mentioned in episode 62. Now, unblending does not resolve all the problems. It doesn't lift all the burdens, but it's a necessary prerequisite. It doesn't heal the effects of trauma all by itself, but it creates a frame where that work can be done. And when you're unblended, when you are naturally recollected, when in IFS lingo you are in self, there's peace and calm inside. 
There's the ability to relate inside. Parts are understanding other parts because they're sharing in the perspective of self. And through the self, they're connected to all the other parts. No longer blind, just in touch with one part of the elephant, but in community with seeing eyes, eyes now open, understanding much more about what the rest of the self is experiencing. And that leads us to be much better able to relate with others, to understand others, to see them in five dimensions, like we were talking about in episode 72, not just in one dimension, right? Because there's only one perspective from one part, blended, taking over, dominating everything within us. And this opens the door to us loving ourself, to loving our neighbor, and to loving our God in a much more focused and deliberate way. And that is what this podcast is all about. That is what the Resilient Catholics community is all about. All right, so now you've been listening to me tell stories and lecture and yabber away here in the podcast, and and that's all well and good. But now we're going to take it up a notch. Now we're going to move on to our experiential learning. We're going to do an experiential exercise around unblending. We're going to learn by doing and learn by being. Right? All the conceptual learning in the world will do you little good if you don't experience these things. You know, that would be like a psychologist who studied love in the books and research articles and, and thought about love and theorized about it and wrote abstract articles about it, but never had a loving relationship with anybody. What does that psychologist really know about love then? Right? So I want you to have much more than just the intellectual concept of unblending. I want you to experience something about unblending. And this is a major part of IFS-informed human formation. It's a major part of IFS-informed practice. It's a major part of IFS-informed therapy. All right, so... All the usual caveats apply. If this doesn't seem to fit with what you need right now, uh, that's fine. Let it go. Right? Maybe something that you do with your therapist. It may be something that you do later on down the road. If you notice that you're getting dysregulated, if you notice that you're going into hyper arousal, we're getting all revved up in the fight or flight, or you're getting all down regulated to numbing out, dissociating, just you know, just getting really, really distracted, shutting down. Well, then obviously stop. And then again, this is not something you should do while you're driving or something that you, that you should do when you're working on the, the factory line or when you're you know, cooking or when you're taking care of kids or whatever. You need some private time for this. We want to take this seriously. So I'm just going to invite you to settle in and just really notice what's up for you inside right now. What's really prominent in your experience could be a body sensation, could be an emotion, could be a thought or a belief, could be an impulse, desire, could be a memory. Whatever is up for you right now, just a big open heart. You know, we're kind of looking for something that might feel a little negative. It might, might be some kind of distress. You know, when those things are psychogenic, when they're caused internally by psychological factors, we look at them as trailheads and they're always connected to a part a part that wants us to know something. I'm going to ask you to focus in on that slightly distressing or maybe moderately distressing experience, whatever it is, body sensation, thought, emotion, impulse, desire, attitude, memory, image. Just see if you can connect with that part. See what that part wants you to know. What it wants to share with you about its experience. What 
What does that part want you to know? See if it can sit with you on your raft. You in the role of a leader. With other parts gathered around looking to you for guidance, for direction, for leadership. See if that's possible in this moment. See if other parts would give you the space to lead your system. If there could be a ceasefire, if there could be an armistice just for a little while inside, enough space on the raft, a calming down, maybe some parts still in the water, that's okay. Your parts may not know that you as the self, you as the core, have the capacity to lead your system if they create the space for you to do that. See if they would be willing to try that experiment. It may seem risky to some. They can come back in and blend if they need to, if they feel like that's what they got to do. But we've got an opportunity here. We've got a moment where maybe that calmness, maybe that curiosity, that compassion, that courage, the confidence, maybe those parts can begin to feel that connection, that heart expanding. Maybe they can feel the beginning of grace coming through you to them. that space so that they can be in relationship with you. You know, a blended part can't be in relationship with the self. It's taken over. There's no space for that. There's no distance to be able to see the part. What we want is to be separate but near with our parts so that we can see them, so we can connect with them. Asking those parts to step back, seeing that space happen, seeing the changes that happen when they're willing to try it, how different it can feel inside. And if that's happening for you, I'm going to invite you to really take that in. Let your parts really see that, really come to know more about what that's like. What would it take to deepen the experience? What did the parts need? to give you more and more space to lead your system. Let your parts know how much you appreciate them if you're feeling that way. And if something's getting in the way of experiencing gratitude toward a part or connection with a part, that's another part getting in the way. It's a part blending. Now, if you're struggling with any of that agitation, frustration, anxiety, indifference, disinterest, coldness, uncaring, timidness, fearfulness, confusion or being muddled and dark inside, any of that internal fragmentation, if it's disjointed, if you're uninspired right now, 
If there's coolness or nastiness towards part, criticism, judgment toward another part, that's all parts blended. That's a part, at least one that's blended. See if he can give you that space. And if you've got that space, let the parts really take that in. That's what being unblended is like when you've got that calm curiosity. Now this can go on, right? We're going to bring this exercise to a close. For now, let your parts know if it's true, only if it's true, that you're going to connect with them later on this. And this is a section of the podcast that you can do over and over again if it's helpful to you. But I'm going to invite you to come back and just, we're going to wrap this. I'm going to ask you if this podcast really makes sense to you and your parts. Do you really get a grip on what we're working on here? Do, you, do these experiential exercises really resonate with you? And do you want more of this kind of thing? Do you want to be with like-minded Catholics who are serious, not only about our Catholic faith, but also about human formation, who want to learn more about loving God, loving neighbor, and loving self in a psychologically-minded way? who want to draw from the best of our understandings of the human person from both the spiritual and the natural world, well, consider the resilient Catholics community, right? That community grew up around this podcast. There was a need. It was more than a year ago. There was a need for people to be able to come together to talk about this stuff, to experience it, to share, right? And that community is open twice a year, each June and each December, We're coming to the end of June. This is released on June 28th. The community closes at midnight Eastern time on June 30th. It's $99 to register and it's $99 a month afterwards in a subscription. And that helps to pay for what it takes to engage in a deep dive into an IFS informed approach to human formation. Lots more experiential exercises office hours, a companion for daily connection, weekly small group work in your company, your own personalized human formation plan tailored to your individual needs and based on your responses to our initial measures kits. There's so much that happens in the Resilient Catholics community. Our premium podcast that comes out weekly, episode 74A, is an experiential exercise for our RCC members on protectors parts resistance to unblending. We're going to take this far deeper in that premium podcast. It's just for RCC members, right? Check all that stuff out at soulsandhearts.com backslash RCC. If you're feeling called to join us, register. You still got a little bit of time before that registration closes again until December. And if you're committed to this podcast, I want you to learn about the community. Come with us. Come with me. Be a pioneer together with us on this pilgrimage. Soulsandhearts.com backslash RCC. Read about the community. 37 have already applied to join the dozens of us already in the community. More listeners are considering it. Like I said, registration closes on June 30th. Bear that in mind, okay? Conversation hours every Tuesday and Thursday from 4.30 p.m. to 5.30 p.m., 317-567-9594. That's my cell phone. You can call me. Uh, if I happen to be on the, a call with somebody else, leave me a voicemail. All right? uh, and if you happen to be a Catholic therapist, right? check out the Interior Therapist community where 55 Catholic therapists are learning all about IFS grounded in the Catholic anthropology. You can check that out at soulsandhearts.com backslash ITC. There's a premium episode for our ITC members, our Catholic therapists interested in IFS, and that's 74T, and it's the importance of unblending within the Catholic therapist, right? This is all about the human formation of Catholic therapists, so Catholic therapists really need to be unblended to work effectively with their clients. So... Tune in next week when we have episode 75. That's where we're going to get into how unblending is so important for the spiritual life, for a life of prayer, for a life of connection to God, for a life of connection to our Mother Mary, all the spiritual dimensions around unblending. And with that, it's a wrap. We will invoke our patroness and our patron, Our Lady, Our Mother, Untire of Knots. Pray for us. St. John the Baptist, pray for us.